The way I cook is very influenced by the way my mother cooked before me. Indeed, most of what I feel about food comes from my family. But I think this makes sense for all of us because food can never be just fuel. It really is our most personal history. And there are certain dishes, which I remember from my childhood, which I want my children in turn to remember eating and be able to cook. Look, this isn't a recipe really. I mean, it's just something I remember my mother making for us at home. I mean, nothing that's been you know, written down or passed down from generations, but we ate it, she cooked it. And, you know, that's what I love about it. It's not, you know, precise charts and nuclear physics. No, but what this is, is something absolutely perfect. It's just soft boiled eggs with, instead of toast soldiers, Asparagus spears, which once you lop off this, and I don't think this is a moment when tapping would be appropriate, you just salt a bit and dip in the asparagus spears. It's been cooked for about six minutes, egg for about four, and oh, it's delicious. And although, of course, you know, soft boiled eggs are slightly nursery ish, in a way you can use this in quite a grown up way if you want, like a starter for a dinner party, I think it makes asparagus go further. I think it's a rather wonderful way of eating it. And what you can do is get wonderful sort of cat's tongue pink plates of Parma ham. And you can just wrap the spears in like, you know, napkins, edible napkins. Mmm, so good. This is one of my paternal grandmother's cookery notebooks, which I love. It's full of things that she's just cut out of newspapers or her friends have sent her. And the actual hardback book costs nine pence, I see, and she got it. Um, some of the recipes I have no desire to do. I mean, I don't really want to do aspic cream. And some I do want. I mean, like this lunch dish, which I like cooking. Um, a nice thing here, chauffeur of chicken, which she's written by hand afterwards. Excellent. And um, this is one of my maternal grandmother's cookery books. This is a bit more modern, I'd say sort of 70s. And I do remember helping her take notes and doing all that. Um, again, very much things like lemon mousse, kipper pate, um, which people don't do that much now. Um, her gingerbread and butter pudding, I still do cook. I mean, I love these because they're a bit like, you know, photograph albums. I mean, they're social history, family history. I like that. This is mine, and I'm afraid I'm not such a good note taker as either of my grandmothers. So, for example, in this notebook, I've written down all the ingredients and what I'm doing, but I haven't put the title. So here I'm trying to work out what on earth was I cooking. But anyway, so, you know, my children will get this. They might not thank me for it, but that's like continuing the family cooking. Sausages and lentils are something my mother often cooked for us tea when we were children, and now I cook for my children. Actually, the way I do sausages and lentils is slightly different than the way my mother did, in the sense that I use these Italian sausages and pre lentils, or sometimes the ones from Italy, from Umbria, lovely ones, wonderful sort of like blue-green slate colour. Let me just get some oil into this pan. So what I need to do first, just bruise a bit of garlic and get the skin off. Now, garlic is cooked just the right amount when you begin to feel or smell the sort of aroma waft up. So now, sausages in. Look at these, all fat pearled and plump. These ones are called Genovese. In other words, they come from Genoa. And what this means is they have basil and garlic and they are heady with both. Put onion on for the lentils and some salt which will stop it from browning because these have to stay soft and somehow meld with the lentils. Very old wooden spoon. I think actually it was my sister Thomasina's. I actually have some here. I think that were, I think this was my mother's. 
I dare say if I dug around for long enough, I could find one of my grandmothers. And I'm going to do a bit of turning over. Oh, lovely. So they're browned on all sides. And what I want is to have a kind of lovely, rich, sticky gravy to eat with this, which is very, very easy to arrange. Just a question of pouring in some wine. Mm, rather wonderful alcoholic facial I'm getting here. And then diluting it a bit with some water. I mean, you could use sherry and water too, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. So lid on, heat down. Lentils. Can you see how beautiful those pebbly lentils, sort of oil slicked bits of translucent onion all through. Right, so now I just give the lentils the same treatment as the sausages. In other words, cover with water generously. The lentils will absorb the water as they cook. Heat down, lid on, and they should both cook in around 20 minutes. And that gives me time to do a little light clearing up and give myself a glass of wine. should be about ready for lift off. So the water's been absorbed, which is perfect. Mmm, lovely. And they're cooked, so it's really just a matter of putting the sausages on top of the lentils. I like keeping the string on, I think it looks so beautiful. Anyway, why give yourself extra work? And then squish down that bruised garlic that went in into the sort of winey juices and just turn up the heat to reduce it a bit because I want them to be really sort of rich and sticky. I shall do some parsley while I wait. Mmm, perfect. That looks about it. So just pour, mmm, look, those lovely juices over. Fling over the parsley. And that's it. I mean, it's not fancy cooking, certainly, but just proper home food. Just as I really value the cookbooks that I've got from my grandmothers, so I really love other people's family compilations. There are a couple here which I particularly love. Stephanie Alexander's recipes my mother gave me and Mimi Sheraton's from my mother's kitchen. I mean, the point about these sorts of books is they tell stories, not just give recipes. And the recipes they do give are, for me, the most important ones. That's to say, home cooking, the antithesis of restaurant food. I mean, here's a recipe for French toast, and I love this, because just because food isn't fashionable anymore doesn't mean we don't want to eat it. And we all want to remember our family favorites. I had completely forgotten about Liptow until quite recently. I don't know why I remembered it, but I did, and then I had to try and evoke it from taste memory and help of a few books. Now, what it is, is really a kind of uh, upmarket sandwich spread that was sort of very fashionable when I was a child and, and before, really. It comes from middle Europe somewhere and is incredibly good and very easy. No cooking at all. So that was some curd cheese, now some cream cheese. And first, just blending them till they're smooth before, you know, adding all my bits and pieces. Oh. Okay, softened. I mean, this is so easy. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. And really, you can just do all these things to taste. I mean, of course you can. I mean, in all cooking is like that, but this particularly. So some French mustard. Caraway seed, which I love. Look at these beautiful capers, these little crocodile skinned rounds. Paprika, I'm using smoked paprika because I love it, but I mean paprika. Look at that wonderful terracotta colour. And some cornichon, which is just these little gherkins. I mean, if you can only get big gherkins, just chop them up. I mean, I'm chopping these anyway. I like quite a lot in here. And this spiky vinaigrous really, you know, helps punctuate the creaminess of the cheese. In. And just mix. Mm. 
That's it. Bit of a scrape done. And then this is a Tupperware which I've lined with cling film because the point is although you can just put this in a bowl and just you know dollop it out uh, on a bit of toast or bagel the real retro experience has to produce it in a kind of molded hump so that's what I'm doing in my own way to so just smooth the top fold back these overhanging bits of cling film and then weigh it down with this tin. Once this has been in the fridge for a couple of hours, it will have chilled and set and you can mould it easily. Can I just tell you something? Until you have eaten lip tower on split, unbuttered poppy seed bagels or toasted black bread, you haven't lived. When I was a child, Whitebait was the restaurant starter. Um, you so rarely see it now that I feel I have to explain to some of you anyway what Whitebait even is. And what it is, is this little fish. It really refers more to the size than to the genus, but it's sort of most commonly sprats or herring. Uh, the original small fry, in fact. And it's incredibly easy to cook them. You just dust in flour and then deep fry, whatever means you want. Get some ordinary pepper, I think. These were my sister Thomasina's favourite food. She always ordered them when we went to restaurants. Um, so it's kind of in memory of her that I cooked them. And then you just really chuck them in a deep fat fryer. You don't have to use something like this. I mean, you can just use a wide saucepan or deep frying pan. The other thing that's really traditional to eat with white bait is brown bread and butter. And ideally, the lemon wedges should be kind of cloaked in muslin and tied like little bonbons. These should be about ready now to come out. Look, let me see if I rustle them. Oh, wonderful papery noise. And just tumble them out onto the kitchen towel. Not that anyone would have been bothered then about excess oil. On their plate. And now this is the most important accompaniment. Some parsley for deep frying. You should use a splatter guard for this, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm just going to stand back instead. It's the water in the parsley. <laughs> that helps. There we are. Mm. Deep fried parsley is wonderful. It's not that unlike that thing of you know seaweed in Chinese restaurants, which is just deep fried shredded cabbage. So sprinkle it on the white bait. Some lemon and eat. Mm. Yeah, crunch. Mm. Time for a revival, I think. There are a few things I like to keep in the larder. Not that I use them a lot, but really more for sentimental than culinary reasons. This. <laughs> Camp coffee, remember that? I have a real fondness for the memory of it. My mother used to make something called milk and a dash, which was warm milk with a few drops of this in. I mean, I think this probably is left over from a long time ago. I don't remember buying it recently. And crystallised violets, which my mother and my grandmother particularly used to like. Look at that, wonderful. Not an everyday ingredient, admittedly. Now this, I do like to use quite a bit, ginger jam really evocative smell for me and it is the basis of my grandmother's delicious bread and butter pudding. The other way my grandmother's bread and butter pudding is different is that she used brown bread, sort of brown bread, in place of white. And what she did is make sandwiches with the bread and this ginger jam and then just squidge them together which gives a lovely kind of juicy aromatic centre to this pudding. I mean, I know that bread and butter pudding had a revival in the 80s and probably now considered, you know, deeply unfashionable and boring. But what I always felt was a great pity is that it just became a kind of restaurant item. And bread and butter pudding isn't restaurant food. I mean, it's home food. Nearly through, I reckon, ten pieces of bread. So five sandwiches altogether, although we're going to cut them, is about right for my pudding basin. Okay. 
This is easy. Well, it's all easy. I mean, it's that sort of cooking. Just cut these sandwiches into triangles. And then just, as pudding basin's been greased with butter, just put these sandwiches in. What I, what I do is what she did. So the first one goes in with a triangle like this, and then the next one with a triangle down this way. And what this does is that you get nice pointy bits peeking out from the custard at the end, and they get lovely browned and crispy and crunchy. Then, again, again just because this is what she did, I just put one along each side. Now these are sultanas, and what I've done is I've just soaked these in rum, and I find the easiest way to do this quickly, so they become really plump and sort of aromatically filled with the, with the liquor, is just putting them in the microwave for a minute and just leave them to cool. Now the custard, because all bread and butter pudding is, is sort of bread, butter, and baked in a custard, soft set one. This is very soft set because I like to use mostly yolks, I don't like too much white. So I have four, yolks and one whole egg just you do need some white to set but if you use too much white i find it makes it too sort of firm a custard and i want it to be really sort of voluptuously tender okay it's sh sugar this is a lot to do with taste i think three of these spoons is plenty after all the fruit is quite sweet and the ginger jam is sweet it's got a heat but it's also got sweetness Bit of gentle whisking. And then some cream. I have to say my grandmother, who had more austere taste and you know lived in a more austere age, just used milk. But I like to use about 500 mils double cream and 200 of full fat milk. Just stir. And then pour this gorgeous yellow cream over the bread and let it soak for about 10 minutes because really you want it to soak in a bit before you bake it. And then all you need to do then is just dab butter over the little pointy bits that stick out and then sprinkle over some demerara sugar in a good crunch and some ground ginger for just aroma and then put it in the oven. Mmm, the smell of my childhood. When my paternal grandmother died, I got given her cookery notebooks. Though I should say that I have no recollection of my grandmother cooking from them, or indeed cooking. She decided very early on that she got vertigo in the kitchen, and therefore, for health reasons you understand, never actually cooked. I do cook from them, actually, though, and this is their lunch dish, that's what it's called, that I do quite a lot. And it's really a free-form pie filled with minced meat. And like all pies, you have to start with the pastry. To make the pastry, measure 250 grams of plain flour and cut 50 grams of hard vegetable fat, like cooking or something like that, and 75 grams of cold unsorted butter. And really, you're just mixing the butter and fat into the flour until what you've got is a kind of sandy porridge oats look. So when you've got this look, you pour in chilled water very, very slowly until you have something which is about to cohere. That's to say, you don't want a clump of dough, you want something that looks like it's shortly to get to be a clump of dough. And at this stage, you can just tip the dough out of the process or out of the mixing bowl and just squidge it together with your hands until you've got a dough and then twist it into two, form a sort of flat, fat disc and put each disc into a plastic bag or wrap with cling film and stick it in the fridge. Like all pastries, it has to sit and rest in the fridge for at least 20 minutes, which gives you time to get on with the filling. Now, I love this. There's something very retro about it. Minced meat, sort of jazzed up with hard-boiled eggs, black olives and tomatoes, and a pinch of allspice. And this must have seemed so sort of adventurous to the post-war housewife. You pass me a knife on.
As far as I'm concerned, it's not just eating together as a family that matters, but also cooking together. I mean, I love cooking with my sister. For the filling, just get a large frying pan out and over medium heat, warm some oil, just a bit of olive oil, ordinary olive oil, vegetable if you want, and just chop up a couple of small onions or one medium to large onion and soften the onion in the pan. If you sprinkle a bit of salt on top of the onion, it will stop the onion from colouring because it extracts water out of the onion and therefore it doesn't actually sizzle and fry. Once you've done that, just tip in half a can of chopped in tomatoes and stir around a bit. Now add 250 grams of minced beef and turn the beef round a few times so that it breaks up and browns on all sides. Pepper? Well, I would wait till it's browned first and steer it all over. Yes. When the meat's brown, although don't be fanatical about it, just mostly brown and most of the pink gone, just add a couple of hard-boiled eggs, roughly chopped, but a handful of black olives, roughly chopped as well. How exotic. I know. Colour and interest. And then give a good turn with a wooden spoon, give a pinch of allspice, a bit of pepper. You might need some salt, but the olives tend to be salty. And then stir well and cook over gentle heat for about 20 minutes. At this stage, you really are going to have to let the meat cool a bit because you don't want to put piping hot meat out onto pastry. So roll out one of the discs into a rough square and then transfer your square onto a baking sheet and start rolling out the other square. And then you can just tip the slightly cooled minced meat onto the first square and then dibble a bit with your fingers into some cold water and just sprinkle it around the edges of the square. This will just help the two bits stick together. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. then plonk your top bit of pastry on top. And I like this bit that comes next because it um, makes you feel competent in a very unjustifiable way, which is though you start squidging the bits of pastry together and roll them up probably about three turns so that you've got a rough sort of humped border all round. And then get a fork out and with the tines curved downwards, just press further to help squidge the border together. It's nice and gooey, isn't it, the mm. pastry? Thanks a lot. And then prong the top of the pastry to make air holes any way you want. Actually, you're the one who went to art school. <laughs> <laughs> and then brush with a bit of egg wash. And egg wash is just a way of saying, uh, you know, an egg with a bit of water and a teeny bit of salt beaten together. And then bake in an oven, moderate oven, for about 20 minutes. <laughs> you are good. clever. <laughs> you do like utensils. Do you? I think oh, that's a very good idea. Nice but not quite yet. I have to put it. The is lovely. Oi, get your hands off that bit. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. Is it eggs that give you that eggy colour? Yes, it is. <laughs>